choices. We make them every day. You made a choice this morning to come to church. It was a good choice. You made a choice to make God a priority in your life today. You made a choice to participate in worship. If you came here and decided to sing and clap, you made a choice to participate in our worship time. You made a choice to give in the offering today or to not give in the offering today. You see, every day we're making choices. And someone once said that, the, that our life is a sum of our choices. Whether it's what we wear or, or, or choosing a job or who we marry or whatever it is. All of the decisions we make in life, they add up to make what our life is and who we become. The only thing that can truly alter those choices is when we allow Christ to come into our life or choose not to allow Christ to come into our life. Because when we allow Him in, He can take all of our negative choices in life and He can renew them to make them something new. But if we choose to ignore Him or reject Him or His Word, then we can have lived a life that was good and do a lot of moral things, and yet it will all crumble into dust at the end because our goodness is not good enough. So, what do we do with our choices? I want to talk this morning about a time in Israel's history. They had just finished conquering uh, all the different cities in their land, the new promised land that God had called them to. And Joshua gathered all the people together. And he knew that during this time, some of them had carried foreign gods out of Egypt. He knew that some of them had started mixing with the foreign gods of the Amorites, the other people in the land that they were in. And he knew that at this stage when they would go off experiencing all the blessings of God in this new land, all the prosperity and the goodness that God had brought to them and the freedom, he knew that if they did not decide in their hearts who they were going to choose to serve, that they would quickly run into trouble. And eventually they did, because as generations would go on, the generation that would choose to serve the Lord, the next generation would get a little further away. And then the next generation would get a little further away from that. It's happening today. It's happening in the church in America today. But this is what he says in Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 to 23. It says, So, the, so fear the Lord and serve Him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshipped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt, and serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates? Or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? But as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. The people replied, we would never abandon the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God is the one who rescued us and our ancestors from slavery in the land of Egypt. He performed mighty miracles before our very eyes. And as we traveled through the wilderness among our enemies, he preserved us. It was the Lord who drove out the Amorites and the other nations living here in the land. So we too will serve the Lord, for He alone is our God. Then Joshua warned the people, You are not able to serve the Lord, for He is a holy and jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you abandon the Lord and serve other gods, He will turn against you and destroy you, even though He has been so good to you. But the people answered Joshua, No, we will serve God. The Lord. You are a witness to your own decision, Joshua said. You have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, they replied, we are witnesses to what we have said. All right, then, Joshua said, destroy the idols among you and turn your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. <coughs> you see, it was a new generation coming into the land of Israel. A generation somewhat influenced by their previous generation. That's a very important thing for us to realize because... How we live our lives affects the generations below us. Do you hear what I'm saying? How we choose to live our lives affect the next generation. And it seems that every generation sometimes will move a little bit further away from God, and a little bit further away from God, until there's a revival or a change of heart in the land that brings everybody back to that place of truly setting themselves apart for Jesus. I'm telling you right now, our generation right now needs a revival. Our generation needs... That for God to move through it, it needs people to turn their direction towards Him and make a difference. Because I see in the American church today, we're moving far, far away from Jesus, even in the church. And our society is moving far, far away from Jesus. We wonder why things are happening in our society, the decisions, the political things, the ramifications all around us. Why are they going on like that? Well, it's because we've become further away from God. 
Israel would also grow further away from God. That generation did serve the Lord. That was their decision. The next generation served the Lord, and, but was a little bit weaker. And the generation after that served the, would, would kind of start mixing serving the Lord with other gods. And so the generations following them would just serve the other gods. And then God would have to bring them into a place of calamity, into a place of suffering, to wake them up, to get them to realize we need to turn towards God again. I say all of that because I believe that it's important that we choose to serve the Lord. Not because our parents chose it, not because our grandparents chose it, but because in our lives we desire Him. You all know there's a difference between doing something out of obligation and doing something because you want to, don't you? There's a big difference than when you're like convicted or, 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 or guilted into doing something than when you want to do it. Is that the truth? Oh, if I don't do it, they're going to be on my head. My boss is going to be mad at me. Man, I want to do this job for y'all. Do a great job. Big difference in what happens. But we sometimes serve Jesus out of obligation and not out of desire. So I want to talk first of this morning about the power of choice. The power of choice. The power that you and I have to determine our future, our lives, and our circumstances. That only begins when that first choice is the choice to choose Jesus, to choose God. You know that there are churches out there that tell you that you didn't have a choice, you're only serving God because He picked you out before the beginning of time and chose you to serve Him, but that you could not resist His irresistible grace. Now, I want to tell you God's grace is irresistible, and God's grace is beautiful. But I want to also tell you this morning, we have a choice whether or not we choose God or don't choose God. Amen. We are not predestined. Only the only way that we are predestined is because God knew who would choose Him and those, the Bible tells us, He predestined to be His own. But God didn't say before the beginning of time, okay, in this generation, uh, all the people in this B group, they're going to hell, and all the people here in this A group, they're going to go to heaven. He didn't predestine people like that. That would be kind of a sick God, wouldn't it? It's not the God that I read about in the Bible, but there's actually belief out there like that. God gave us the power of of choice. Why do you think he gave us the power of choice? He gave us the power of choice because he doesn't want us to serve him and to love him because we have to. He wants us to serve him and love him because we want to. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He wants us to want him. Amen. That's why he put within us a knowledge of him. That's why when we desire him, things are different. Now let's look at the beginning of the story of Adam and Eve. In Genesis 3, 1-7, to it tells us this. It says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, You must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her. So guys, you can't say that he came along and she deceived him. He was with her the whole time. And he ate it too, because we all know that guys are suckers for whatever the wives want them to do. Started off at the beginning. That's why we have to be the men of the house. Right, guys? Come on. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. I want you to think about the garden for a second. Here's Adam and Eve in the garden. They have utopia. Everyone in this world is trying to get back to utopia. The harder they fight to get back to utopia, the worse I think it's getting. And they want to get back. They had a perfect world. They didn't have to work. They didn't have to cook. Ladies, they, they weren't cooking in those days. They didn't have to, all they did was pick the fruit of the tree and it was enough. Whatever grew on those trees was enough to sustain them. And they were blessed. And in the cool of the day, Adam would walk with God and he'd commune with him. He had fellowship with God just like he was designed to have fellowship with God. They had but one decision that they had to make. To not eat from one out of thousands of trees in the garden. That shouldn't really be that hard. Just one tree. God said, just don't 
eat from that one tree. Well, why do you think he put the tree there? If God did not give us a free will, if God did not give us a choice, he would have never put the tree in the garden. He would have just left it out. And the world would have been the mess that we're in. Because sin would have never entered. But he gave them only one choice to have to make. And that was to desire to obey him. That tree was there not to approve anything, but for them to desire to be obedient to him. And to choose obedience over disobedience. And what happened? They chose disobedience. In their free will, they made a choice that was destructive to them. And they lost the garden and all that there was in it. Because of that one decision. The power of choice is great. It determines whether we will have life or death. The power of choice is great. If we choose to obey and to follow, we can have great direction. But if we choose to disobey, it can bring destruction. You know, God doesn't want us to be robots that just kind of do this and do that because he's making us do it. That's why he gave us free will. The Bible tells us that he leads us like a shepherd. He is our good shepherd because he doesn't want to force anybody to serve him. If you look at the life of an eastern shepherd, a shepherd from the, from, you know, the, the Middle Eastern world, they did not come, you know, in the, in the great American West, what happens when the cows are out? We go behind them and we drive those animals. We drive them to where we want them to go. We have cattle drives. But an eastern shepherd was different. He actually got to know his sheep. He handled his sheep. He interacted with them. And the sheep actually learned to recognize his voice. And when he would lead his sheep, he didn't go behind them. He went in front of them. And they followed. That's how God wants us to serve him. He wants to lead us that we will come behind and follow. That's why he gave us power of choice. Because he doesn't want to drive us to what we have to do. He's not a slave maker. But he's a gentle shepherd and master who leads us into good things. Amen. Revelation twenty two seventeen 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts, Come. For whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Whoever does what? Desires. desires. This choice we make for salvation, this choice we have to serve Jesus, no one's forcing us to make that choice. But those who desire, desire to know Christ, that decision brings them into the mercies and the blessings and the goodness of God. Now, we all want mercies and blessings and goodness. How many of you like it when you pray and God answers your prayer? How many of you when God blesses you, provides for your needs? We all like God's blessing, don't we? How many want to go to bed tonight and think if you didn't wake up the next morning that you'd be in heaven instead of hell? Amen? We're deceiving ourselves in this world. We tell everybody that everybody's going to heaven. That's not true. We're not all going to heaven. If you don't know Jesus, you're not going to heaven. So I want to talk about the urgency of choice. The urgency of choice. You see, when Joshua was talking to them, he said to them, Choose you this day, today, whom you will serve. He didn't say, go home and think about it, and if, you, and if in a few weeks you want to, just choose Jesus. He said, choose today. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, for he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You see, I think there's a lot of people in America, and there's a lot of people in the church today, and they are still in the decision-making process. Ever been in the decision making process? You're deciding if you're going to buy a new house or you're going to buy a house. And you go look at a house and you look at another house and you look at the third house and the fourth house and the fifth house. And you look at houses after houses after houses. And you go home and you, you evaluate them and you kind of weigh out the pros and the cons and you decide what you're going to do. But finally, you can look all you want, but until you do the paperwork for the mortgage and until you do the paperwork for the house, you're not going to get the house. You're not going to move in. You're going to always be in that decision-making process. Or if you choose to say, I'm not going to buy the house, I'm going to stay where I am. It happens that way with cars. It happens that way with jobs. With any large process that we're in. But sometimes we're afraid to cross over the threshold into that decision because we don't know the changes that it might make, the differences it might make. 
And so we're trying to determine, is this going to be better or worse for me? Well, I think people are doing that with Jesus too. We have a choice to make, and it's not one that's urgent. It's not one that you get to think about. Not because God is a God of, of high-pressure sales tactics. But it's a choice that we need to make because Jesus is coming back. Because no one knows what today holds. If we'll even still be there to make that choice the next day. But I think a lot of people are struggling. They, 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 they don't want to go to hell. Does anybody want to go to hell? Anybody in this room want to go to hell? You're smart. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to go to hell. But everything between me and hell, everything else, I'm kind of used to that. I'm kind of used to the way I've partied. I'm kind of used to the way I've lived my life. I'm kind of used to, you know, having whatever relationship I want or doing whatever I want. I do want to go to heaven, though. Heaven looks pretty good over there. And Jesus, yeah, he seems pretty good. But, you know, a lot of people, I just, they just don't want to go to hell. So they want Jesus because they don't want to go to hell. I'm not sure if that's enough. Because in everything we do to serve Jesus is just to keep us out of hell. But we were created to have a relationship with Christ. God wanted us to choose Him because He wanted us to desire Him. And so I think people just don't want to go to hell. If that's the only thing that's motivating them, they kind of sit there in the middle of that decision-making process kind of on the fence because they really don't want to let go of everything between them and hell but they don't want to miss out in heaven either. Well, I want God to answer my prayers. I want God to bless me financially. I want God to do these things for me. But come on, really? It's like, I don't know what serving the Lord is going to entail. I don't know if I want to have to do that. So they kind of hang in the middle. The Israelites were a little bit in that place. You see, some of them were still holding on to the gods of Egypt. Some of them were still holding on or were take, partaking of the gods of the Amorites and the gods in the land that they were at. And they were having God and a little bit of the other idols as well. And Josh was like, choose today who you're going to serve. You can't have this world and have him too. Ah, but if I go with him, what if, what if it doesn't work out? And then I burn my bridge. I, I don't know, what, I think I read it on someone's Facebook. Some, bur some bridges are good to be burned. Some bridges are good to be burned because then you can't return there. Amen. You want to know the best bridge to burn? Is the bridge to the world. Burn the bridge to the world so you only have the bridge to go so you can serve because then it becomes the desire of your heart. If we're always pining for the, you know, if you change jobs and you're always missing the old job and what it is, you're never going to be effective at the new job because you're always pining for the old job. People do that in relationships and marriages and always pining for the old one. You can't have it back now. You better focus on the new one. Urgency says change and change today because you don't know what life is going to hold. You don't know what's going to happen. If you delay, you could be in danger. You know, I think back to Noah when he was building the ark. You all remember Noah and the ark? 2 Peter 2.5 says, And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. I read that for a reason because it tells us in Peter that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. You know, that ark didn't go up in a couple of weeks. It didn't go up in a couple of years. Noah was building that ark for a long time. And I want you to think of what was going on. When he was, the world had never seen rain. At the time that Noah lived, the world had not seen rain. There was a dew that would come down. The hemisphere of our, world, of our earth was different at that time. And it was a different, a different era. And here's Noah out in the middle of land, building a giant boat. I mean, people are thinking, you're crazy, man. But Noah took that opportunity to preach righteousness. He took that opportunity to say, look, there's punishment coming for the way we're living, but you can change. He invited people to come on the ark with him. And no one would. The only ones who would get out of the ark with Noah was his family. Nobody else would come. Even though he preached righteousness. Genesis 7, 16 tells us, A male and female of each kind entered just as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord closed the door behind them. Not one raindrop fell until the door closed behind them. Hollywood might have portrayed Noah differently. They really portrayed Noah really differently. 
But God shut the door of the ark, not Noah. God shut the door. And then the earth began to open up and the rains began to fall and the waters began to rise. The only problem was, it was too late to make a choice. When we feel hell nipping at our feet, we often want to make a choice. But the decision-making time was too late. The opportunity was gone. The choice needed to be made before. You know, we are living in a day. And I am firmly convinced that Jesus Christ will come back even before I retire. I do not believe that I will even see my retirement years. I believe that the world is getting so right and so ready for the return of Christ. I see things happen in our society. I see, I see the, the one world government coming in. I see all the turmoil in this world. I see all the different agendas that are going on. You know, I always find it kind of interesting that when they, the Bible says, like, you know, as it was in the days of Noah, and so they'll be eating and drinking and giving to marriage. I'm kind of thinking, why did it say giving to marriage? Do you ever see kind of the fascination our society has with, with marriage? I mean, I know half the people well, don't get married anymore. But marriage is all, because it's all just about a big party. And, you know, Hollywood has how many TV shows about marriage and wedding dresses and wedding days and this and that? And then what's the big fight? The big fight for homosexuals to be able to marry? It's all like, it's all, it's all over. And I'm going, you know, our society is very focused on the party. They don't really care about the marriage itself, but they're focused on the party. They're focused, we say, given the marriage, they're focused about the celebration. It's kind of a big thing. I see the way governments are failing. I see the shift in the Middle East. I see the fact that that we're microchipping animals and now they're starting to want to microchip people. You know, for a generation when you see people all around you that become so atheistic, so agnostic, no one's ever going to fear the beast, the mark of the beast. And I see that when we talk like a Christian, when we talk like a Christian who believes in this Bible, we're now considered nuts. We're considered crazy. And so many churches are giving in to the... They're ignoring what the Word of God says. Yesterday, we were, we were, having, we were, we were down in Denver, and uh, we, we went to have some frozen yogurt, and we ended up going right by Highlands Church. And I wanted to... I kind of want to... I've heard the name Highlands Church since I've been here. I kind of was curious about it. I thought I'd heard it in the name for an Assembly of God Church. So I looked it up, and I wanted to see what they believed. You know, the pastor graduated from Fuller Theological Seminary, a very respected... Um, evangelical seminary and stuff and says that the church followed evangelical beliefs but they have varied from them recently because they openly op- they open themselves to the LGBT community in their community and in their leadership I thought for a second you've got to be kidding me now I don't care if, I don't care if someone from the LGBT community comes to our church that's totally fine by me because our church is for it's not just for Christians it's for people who don't know Jesus and we better love sinners, absolutely. We better love the sinner. But when they said leadership, that meant that they're embracing saying there's nothing wrong with that. We are becoming, and what does the Bible say? It says, as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so will be when Jesus returns. There's such a major shift. You see, the door's getting ready to close. The door of opportunity to choose Jesus is getting ready to close. And I think there's going to be a lot of people who go to church every week, but they're kind of hanging between the world and God. And they're going to be mighty shocked when they don't find themselves on the right side of the door. And you hear what I'm saying this morning? They're going to be awfully surprised. Even Jesus spoke, said, you know, you call me Lord, Lord, you did these things in my name, but depart from me because I never knew you. Because it's not just enough to call yourself by the name of Christ. We have to serve Christ. We have to choose this day whom you will serve. God gives us a choice. He doesn't force it on us. No one is forcing serving Jesus on anybody. He gives us a choice, but when we choose it, we have to choose to serve Him. We have to choose to follow Him, because the next thing we need to talk about, there's responsibility in that choice. The responsibility of choice. When we choose something, it's our responsibility to follow through on the choice we make. You buy a house, you need to pay the mortgage. You accept a job, you need to show up. There's responsibility that goes with our decisions. When we choose to serve Jesus, we need to put Him in charge of our life. We need to surrender to Him. We need to give Him control. 
You know, Joshua looked at him and said, You can't even really serve God on your own. You know, I'm glad I didn't live in the Israelites today. We have the Holy Spirit in us now, the presence of God with us. It makes all the difference in the world because Jesus came that we can actually choose to serve God. Because in their day, all they had was the law to follow, and that just became obligation. But today, we've gone so far away from what we call legalism into grace. And I believe in the grace of God, but we've gone so far into that grace that we have forgotten that there are behaviors and actions that go along with following and serving Jesus. You know, I remember studying and even experiencing the intensity of being a Pentecostal people. And I remember the stories and and studying about how when the Spirit of God was poured out at the beginning of the 20th century, in the early 1900s, as the new century was coming in, it came upon people who were actually in a holiness movement, following after wanting to be more like Christ, and as they sought more and more of God, the power of God came down. I don't see people seeking Jesus anymore. We don't spend any time with Him anymore. We don't seek Him out anymore. And we, yet we expect Him to move on our behalf and, and to do things, but we're not seeking the Lord. We're not desiring Christ. You see, those people, we call it legalism now, but, but those people, they were choose to live so far away from the world. No movies, no bars, no drinking, no smoking, no drugs, no, 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 no pants for women, no earrings, no... And, you know, we've come, as the generations have gone by, we've said that doesn't, that legislation doesn't make you holy before God. And it doesn't. But what makes us holy before God are the choices we make to serve Him and lining up our choices with what God's Word says. And when we choose to live like God's Word teaches us to live, not because we're supposed to. You see, what happened was that first generation, they wanted to experience the power of God. They would give anything to do that. And then their kids, they would tell them, you need to have this too. So if you do, so do this, do this, and do that. So the kids would do this, do this, and do that. And then those people raised their kids and said, you can't do that. That's not allowed. And then you start having generations going, well, we can't do this, we can't do that. Well, I don't want to go to church like that. And it stopped becoming, stopped becoming about the desire for the things of God. You see, God is powerful, God is real, His Spirit is real, and He wants us to know Him. He wants us to know Him, He wants us to commune with Him, He wants to, he wants to be intimate in our life and interact with us. But Joshua had to tell the people to do something, he said, get rid of your idols. <coughs> get rid of them! <coughs> he said, if you want to serve the Lord this day, then go get your idols and get rid of them. Now, we think of an idol as a little statue. Or a little, you know, something that we can look at. And in some ways it was. But that statue represented some other form of worship. That statue represented some other means of serving a different god. A lot of those pagan statues, a lot of those pagan gods, they had different ritualistic forms of how they worshipped. There was the god of, of, of Mini, that, that in the day that Israel was, was taken captive into the Assyrian capital. He, they were the gods of fortune and luck. Do you know how you worship them? You went to their temple and you played games of chance. Yes, you gambled. And that's how you worship those gods. There were other gods. And how they worshiped those gods was they would kill babies. Kind of like abortion in America today. There were other temples, and a majority of temples, and in those temples they had temple prostitutes. And you committed fornication or adultery, whether it was with a person of the same sex or an opposite sex. And that's how you worship that God. Are we really any different today? There were other times you went to when you got drunk. You see, we might not call them temples anymore. We might not call them idols anymore. But if you look at the wickedness in our society around us, we need to, as Christians, we need to get rid of all of our idols. We need to begin choosing this day whom we will serve. We need to get off the fence in the middle. We need to stop looking and saying, I don't want to go to the world. We need to say, I'm going to move towards Jesus. There needs to become a difference in our lives. When you are saved, you are changed. Changed. 
James 1.21 says, So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives, and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. You know, we're going to be faced really soon in in our church. We're going to be faced really soon in this country. Christians are being are under attack. It's not going to change. It doesn't even matter if we elect the president that we think will do better. I don't think there's any president right now. There's no presidential choices that are good. But regardless of how we feel about that, we've got one side that's extremely embracing all immorality, and we've got another side that's just, you know, maybe conservative in financial principles, but really isn't embracing values of Christianity anymore. We're in a scary place as a country. But what's happened is the right to speech, the right to freedom, it's all going away. And all of a sudden, Christians who serve Jesus, you know, we're considered pretty radical anymore. And so the church has tried to dumb down. Now, I believe that we need to be relevant to our society. Don't get me wrong. We need to be relevant to those around us. But the church is dumbing down so much, there's no difference between the church and the world anymore. They can't see any difference. And, and it feels safe and comfortable. But you know what? God didn't call us to be safe and comfortable. He chose us to serve Him. To desire to serve Him. Not for us to become like the people. Joshua knew if they didn't choose then, that the other people would rub off on them rather than rubbing off on the other people. There are more unchristians in our world than Christians anymore. And there are more Christians in the body of Christ anymore that still live like the world than there are Christians who don't live like the world anymore. And so the ways of the world that, that idols are kind of slipping into the church. An idol is anything that you refuse to give up. It doesn't even have to be a sinful thing. But anything that becomes means more to you than serving Jesus. Jesus is supposed to be on the throne of our hearts. He's supposed to be the king in our lives. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. And a new life has begun. You might be afraid because, you know, we have to trust when we go to that new life. We have to trust because we might have to make decisions that don't make sense to us. We might have to make decisions that are contrary to the way this world makes decisions. Why? Because we're going to have to trust that God's in control. We're going to have to trust that what God's word gives us is truth. We're going to have to believe it and stand on it. When I was getting ready for this, I was looking at some different videos and I was watching, y'all remember the, 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 the old chorus? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. The cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back, no turning back. Those words were penned by the words, based on the words of a man in India who gave his heart to Jesus. And his Hindu tribe was against that decision. So they pulled his family out of their home into the center of the community. And the chief of the tribe told him, renounce your faith in Jesus. And he said, I cannot do that. I have decided to follow Jesus. They then slaughtered his family in front of him and said, renounce Jesus. And he said, though none go with me, I will follow. You see, 
he recognized that to serve Jesus, he desired Christ more than anything. And he was willing to trust God with his life, with the life of his children and his wife, his family. He was willing to trust them into God's hands. He had to by lose everything to follow Jesus. You see, when we're in places of blessing, we don't think about that. Israel had just come to a place of blessing in the promised land. <coughs> Everything was before them. <coughs> we sometimes, I think, are so blessed in America that we are afraid. But, you know, there might come a point where people are going to take away what we have if we choose to follow Jesus. But let me tell you, if we can't choose to follow him, when it might be a little bit of ridicule at work or ridicule at school amongst friends. If we choose to follow, if we can't choose to follow him now, when it means making the decision between uh, going to the drunken party or, or not because someone might not like it or it might offend a relative, what are we going to do when it comes down to life and death choices when that door begins to shut on this world before Jesus comes? Will we be able to say, I have decided to follow Jesus? You see, the butterfly effect is just that, that, that a butterfly flaps its wings on one side of the world and the wind carries, builds pressure, and grows till it becomes a hurricane on the other side. Our choices begin small, but they mount up and become bigger. If we're not making choices that honor God in His Word, if we're not choosing to follow, to serve Jesus, then our choices can lead us in the wrong direction and to destruction. There's a responsibility that comes with our choices. But if we use the power of our choice to choose Jesus, to not delay in choosing Him because we desire to follow Him no matter what, then our choices will influence our life. And as we continue to make choices that build upon that principle of serving Christ, then we will continue to grow in our lives to become more like Christ. Those decisions become easier as we go, not harder. But those are our choices we have to make. So I ask you today, who do you choose to serve? Could you be standing somewhere in between the two? Or are you wholly pursuing Jesus? Because our days are short. The time does draw close. And God is looking for those who want to serve Him. He won't force you to do anything you don't want to do. He's a gentleman. But He's looking for those who want <coughs> to serve Him. Can you truly say in your heart today, I have decided to follow Jesus? <laughs>